As this is all going on, I'm feeling like my mind is breaking. As this is all going on, okay? As you're shooting Wayne and Judy? Yeah. As everybody's telling us all of this is terrible event is occurring, my mind is breaking more and more. It takes a certain kind of evil to kill your own family. But what about three generations of it? This case is a messed up one, and the motive? It really wasn't worth its weight in lead. Hi there, and welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime. We post both solved and unsolved cases weekly to this channel, so if that's your sort of thing, please consider subscribing. Today we're in a small city called Carnation, and interesting fact, it's just down the road from Seattle, Washington, where I was born before moving to England and losing my accent. So what in Tarnation happened in Carnation? Sorry, I won't say that again. But grab a coffee, or whatever drink you prefer, sit back and relax. Let's investigate. Our story starts in Carnation, Washington. Carnation is located about 25 miles east from Seattle. And although Carnation is classed as a city, it's only one square mile, with a population of 2,100 people. The same population you could fit in Blenheim Palace. Carnation was established in the mid-1800s, and like it was then as it is now, most of its population is in the farming industry. Surrounded by the Cascade foothills and right on the Snoqualmie River, Carnation is the perfect spot to experience the unspoiled deep green of the Northwest. The area is safe and considered a good place to raise family, though I couldn't agree with that on Christmas Eve of 2007. Among the 2100 residents were the Anderson family. Judy Anderson and her husband Wayne Anderson were a soon retiring couple, married for over 31 years. They had a son and two daughters, all of which were now adults. Wayne was an engineer for Boeing in Seattle, he'd worked there for 27 years. He was a family man, enjoyed fishing and rebuilding Ford cars in his spare time, and his wife Judy Anderson worked for the US Postal Service. Their son Scott, 32, was married to Erica, and together they had two kids. Olivia was five, Nathan was three. And although Scott and his sister Mary had both moved out long ago, the remaining sister Michelle still lived with the Andersons on their property. She had a boyfriend called Joseph McEnroe, and the two lived on a trailer outside of the house still on the same plot of land. There were small feuds in the family, a few murmurings about who owes what money, and Michelle's parents were also pressuring her to start paying rent for the trailer that she and her boyfriend lived in. But nothing significant or uncommon, the family was otherwise happy. The day is Christmas Eve 2007. The Andersons family had a gathering planned at Wayne's and Judy's house. The home was warm and cosy that afternoon. The Christmas tree stood tall, a few presents tucked neatly underneath, the smell of roast dinner in the air. Judy was wrapping up presents in the kitchen, and Wayne was relaxing merrily on the sofa. But then everything changed. The time was 4pm, and as Wayne and Judy enjoyed the comfort of their own home, their front door swung open and in walked two assailants, one with a hidden 357 revolver, the other with a 9mm pistol. This is the first of many surprises to the story though. The two people that walked in were, in fact, well, they were Michelle and Joseph. Wayne and Judy were unaware what the two were really there for until it was too late. Joseph and Michelle, they acted like nothing was amiss. Joseph went to meet Judy in the kitchen and distract her, while Michelle shot her own father. This was however messy. As Michelle tried to shoot Wayne, she missed, and when she tried to fire again, the gun jammed. Joseph then stormed into the living room to take lead. He shot Wayne, and then he turned round and he shot Judy. It was only the start to their devastation. Once the two had killed Michelle's parents, they dragged their bodies and put them into the shed outside. They then went back into the property and cleaned up the crime scene, so anyone visiting later that day wouldn't know what happened. And those visitors, arriving just one hour later, would be Scott and his family. Wayne and Judy hid, waiting for Scott, Erica and their two kids to arrive. They waited about an hour, 
when they finally showed up at around 4pm. Nothing seemed amiss, so the family got comfortable by the tree, probably wondering where the rest of the family were. And that's when Joe and Michelle appeared. Michelle confronted Scott about the money he owed her. This broke out into an argument, and as she pulled out the gun, he charged at her. He was incapable of doing anything though, by the time he reached her, she'd shot him twice. While this was happening, Erica, she jumped over the sofa and dialed 911. And by the time the deadly pair had managed to reach her, she'd connected to an operator. The call only lasted a few seconds. Erica managed to scream, not the kids. But by then Joe had pulled the phone out of her hand, taken the batteries out and thrown it against the wall, destroying it. He then shot Erica twice. And with only 14 bullets, Michelle Anderson and Joseph McEnroe had wiped out three generations of the Anderson family. In response to Erica's 911 call, the operator was concerned about the noise she'd heard. While she at the time didn't know what Erica had screamed out loud, she recognised it sounded like an argument. So authorities were later dispatched to the Anderson property. However, Michelle knowing that the police were likely to come, had already locked the property's gate in anticipation. And police, they met that gate with laziness. Gates locked, boys. Time to go home. In usual circumstances, the festive period is often short but sweet. While some manage to stay away from work until the new year, postal workers are back in on December the 26th. Boxing Day. This was when Judy was expected to return to work. And only that morning, when she never did, her colleague and best friend Linda Thiel began to grow suspicious. Judy was a reliable worker. It was very rare for her to miss a day. With Linda convinced something wrong was afoot, she decided to visit the Andersons' property, arriving there just after 8am that morning. When she arrived, she was met with the same obstacle as the police did. The gate was locked. However, she used her, uh, common sense and walked around it. Seriously, she walked around it. But when she got to the front door, things weren't that great. Linda knocked three times, though her greetings went unanswered. Fourth time wasn't the charm either. So she tried the door instead. The door was unlocked, so she called for her friend as she opened it. And that is when, from across the room, she then discovered Erica and Nathan's bodies. Without thinking about her safety, she rushed into Judy's and Wayne's bedroom and dialed 911. 911? Uh, there's been a murder. There's three people dead that I can see right now. Inside? I just came up, she works with me. Inside the house? Yes. What do you see? There's a baby and a man and a woman, and she's my best friend. <laughs> She told the operator that their daughter Michelle lived on the property, and she'd also been upset recently over money issues. She was already beginning to be suspicious about their daughter. Police arrived at the Anderson property at around 9.30. The first they were to find was Scott, followed by Erica and Nathan. When searching on the property began, they then found Judy's and Wayne's bodies, which were put inside the shed. But where were Michelle and Joe? At around lunchtime, the two of them arrived at the property in their black pickup truck. To get there, they had to go by roughly a dozen police cars, and by that time, media too. So, how would you react if you pulled up to a loved one's property and you saw dozens of police cars surrounding the perimeter? Worried? Shocked? Horrified? Not for these two. Nope. They didn't seem bothered at all. Not even a question about their parents or their welfare. Just a quick, could we get in? To the closest officer they could find. This raised police's eyebrows immediately. Media crews actually recorded the moment that they were separated for questioning. While in custody, Michelle told detectives that she and Joe travelled to Las Vegas on Christmas Eve to get married. But after getting lost, the two turned around and came home. Right. When Michelle was asked why she thought authorities were at her house, she immediately broke down and cried. The first thing she said, What the hell have I done? I'm a monster. 
Detectives also asked Michelle why she felt the need to wipe out her entire family. She later explained that she was tired from everyone stepping on her. Her brother Scott owed her over $40,000, and her parents had started asking her to pay rent for the trailer that she was living in. And for the kids, she thought that they'd be traumatised for life. Apparently, the only mercy was death. Michelle alluded that she had been planning their murders for about two weeks, and that involved asking her boyfriend Joe to help him. Michelle iterated almost every detail to detectives. In fact, it took over two hours for her to describe everything. She would even lead detectives to where she and Joe discarded one of the two guns, near Stilaguamesh River. On December 28th, 2007, Michelle Anderson and Joseph McEnroe were both charged with six counts of aggravated murder. Michelle confessed saying, I want the most severe punishment, which would be the death penalty. But it wouldn't be until 2015 and 2016 where the two partners in crime met their juries. And the trials wouldn't go without drama either. On January the 25th, 2015, Joe took the stand first. He was barely able to speak at times due to being heavily medicated with anti-anxiety and antidepressants. And even at one point, he began to laugh hysterically. When describing the look on Judy Anderson's face when he shot her, he mentally broke down. So I moved, so I went and um, moved Judy first. I put a bag over her head because I couldn't look at all because of see the emptiness well that she should be. <laughs> Joseph's defense claimed that Michelle had been manipulating him, and with Joseph mentally ill, he had no reasonable judgment to deny her demands. He carried on to lash out during his trial. On May the 13th, 2015, Joseph was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He narrowly escaped the death penalty as well, with 8 of 12 jurors favouring that demand. And next, it was Michelle's turn. On January the 15th, 2016, her trial began, starting exactly one year after Joseph's did. Michelle's defence claimed that her parents and brother had been abusing her over the years, but this sent mixed messages to the jury. She, in fact, in a confession tape, brought up the subject of money 35 times. She failed to show full regret in court too. On March the 4th, 2016, Michelle, like Joseph, was convicted of six counts of aggravated murder in the first degree. And on April the 21st, she too was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. She and Joe will never see freedom again. And that's the story of the Anderson family. I still don't understand the necessity to this case. Granted, murder is always wrong, but to your family, ones that loved and supported and cared for you, it blows your mind, no pun intended, to think that your son or daughter could do this to you. And over Christmas? It's a time to love, not to hate. The two were both monsters, but I feel extra resentful to Michelle. They were her family. Thank you so much for watching this video today. If you enjoyed the case, then please remember to subscribe and like the video. What do you think of the Andersons case? Do you think that Michelle is worse than Joseph, or do you think they're equally as evil as one another? Let me know what you think in the comments below, and I'll get back to you. Thank you once again, folks, and I'll see you in the next video. Look after each other. Goodbye.